Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Yarwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lintamande. Crisis of Faith, episode 170. Leave Pilar fucking out of this. She can't do anything unusual unless it serves Caden Kaelian's and Asmodeus's interests simultaneously, and somehow Pilar doubts that will be the case here. Not actually true. Pilar doesn't need Snack Service's agreement to use the powers of her oracular curse. It's Pilar's curse after all. Since fucking when? Since fucking always. That one time with Savar you did try to plan your own parties. You could tell whether they'd go through or not. Remember? Pilar just got too angry at her curse to try using her own powers for herself. Does that mean Pilar can now sweep up paladins without having to throw them a going-away party? No! That requirement is part of her curse! It wouldn't be much of a curse otherwise. But the part where Snack Service only invokes the curse's powers when that simultaneously serves the interests of Caden Kylian and Asmodeus, that part is all Snack Service. Pilar can act on her own if she chooses. Great. Well, Pilar is going to report all this and then do whatever her superiors tell her about that. Mylal or Subirax. Which orders Pilar gets will totally depend on who she asks for orders. Just saying. Lady Avaricia is very busy with training her chemists and doesn't really have time to be ranted at by an idiot child. But if Asmodia thinks that something to do with how the chemistry project is running is undermining Asmodia's authority... That seems like a very serious problem, and Lady Avarizia will of course obey any instructions from her superiors to cease doing whatever it is they assess as undermining Asmodea's authority. The way in which Asmodeans, which is what they are, of course, do something else which is not that, is that they obey their superiors. If Asmodea is having trouble persuading her superiors that Lady Avaricia is doing something wrong, she should consider the possibility that her superiors don't think Lady Avaricia is doing something wrong, and even the possibility that her superiors think that Asmodia is doing something wrong, and this will be a useful corrective. She can't really think what Asmodia's superiors might think Asmodia is doing wrong, though there was that time, two days ago, when Asmodia told an audience of dozens of foreigners she was not an Asmodean, and was a potential defector. It seems like maybe, to whatever extent Asmodia's authority has been undermined here, it's by the rumors about that. Maybe Asmodia could lay the rumors to rest by pledging herself to the service of Asmodeus and repenting of her past idiocies. And then, of course, they could do something else which is not this. Avarikia is obviously being given enough rope to hang herself probably on Savar's previous orders to my y'all since neither of those two are stupid, Asmodia is happy to go back to work. She is just making it very clear that the inevitable explosion which follows this did not need to happen, and is Avaricia's fault. It won't be Avaricia who does it with her own hands. They will obviously try to engineer matters to make it appear to be the fault of Savar loyalists, but it'll be Avaricia's fault because that part was utterly predictable. Witness Asmodia, predicting it right now. Everyone knows in the reality handling section of their brain that this is actually true, and the Queen and Most High will know it, right? Great. Now let's go continue with what we were previously doing, until the conflict Avarisha created starts causing delays and wasted time, beyond what Asmodia and Avarisha have spent already. There is actually something Dathilani about assuming that all people capable of reason will agree with you and your assessment of a situation, and therefore you don't need to be loyal or remember your place or even deliver an actual victory on the one task you've been assigned. She doesn't mean that in a complimentary way. Go back to hanging yourself, tropeless side character. This security has not gotten laid in the last two months, ever since he was pulled onto the project as a very reliable-seeming Asmodean to monitor girls at risk of defection. Myalyal thought his sex partner was too much of a liability with Keltham around. So he asked the moment Keltham was gone. Is it now acceptable for him to have Ray's dead cast on that very special person, where he spends most of his salary on malediction and Ray's dead to keep them in hell whenever they're not being used by him? 
He's currently paying to have General Repose cast on their corpse once per week so he doesn't have to pay even more for resurrection. Maya Yall acknowledges this security has been doing a competent job, unlike many of his fellows. Maya Yall would usually accept a request like that from a subordinate like this one. But things like that are not deserved in a tyranny. And the unfortunate fact is that Sever still has some lingering issues about men and women that might be triggered by being around a situation like this. This security has thought of that. Once he understood the situation on Project Lawful, he had his last partner's corpse disposed of, they can stay in hell forever now, and he got a new male partner maledicted so he could have a non-sever triggering male plaything whenever Keltham finally left. This security most enjoys sex with very broken people who can't talk, who can barely manage to do anything, but are absolutely desperate to please him in any way they can still manage, so they won't get sent back to hell again for longer. Sue him, okay? Everybody's got their special thing. Okay, fine then. Make sure you keep it where it won't make a mess or disturb the girls. If one day you find it gone with only a cookie left behind, don't say Mayol didn't warn you. Yay! Yes, even Mayol is slightly skeezed out by this. He doesn't have moral objections, obviously. It's just, this kink is not his kink. But if you ask Igorian to send you extremely reliably loyal Asmodeans, you're going to get some people like that. Yep, Project Lawful definitely now has some people like that, back in Assyrian. Not necessarily at exactly the same time. Rise and be seated. What did you think of him? We have a problem, Your Majesty. I don't know what problem exactly. And it'd be much less of a problem if I did. If he were one of the girls, I'd reassign him to the Winter Palace and get him something. Small and concrete to take care of. Maybe a songbird. A familiar, if he had the knack for reading a scroll. He said he thinks he'll be recovered by tomorrow. He doesn't really feel that anything is real. And I don't think I even see that improving. It's not exactly something one can persuade him of. Maybe tomorrow he'll be in more of a mood for strategic planning. But the thing that feels wrong... I would be very surprised if it were no longer wrong tomorrow. He's not a cruel man. Maybe Chiliax was trying to make him evil that way, but if so, that's a fact about them, more than about him. How would you do it? How would I make Keltham evil, Your Majesty? Not with girls he could hit. I... I'm not sure I should speak of this, actually. Because it's critical of our office. We'll bear it. He wants to be surrounded by happy people, who are grateful for him, and not damaged people, who desperately need things from him. He wants things to make sense, and happen for reasons. He doesn't want to do his best and be hated and resented for it. He wants something that his world, maybe, really could offer. But Galarian, when it offers it, is lying. He said, if reality is going to throw tiny detective stories at me on top of that, then this so-called reality can burn. And reality does, in fact, do that. Keep having more detail, where you don't want it, where you aren't grateful for it. And so he's going to decide that it should burn. Well then, we'll pay him to not burn it. With what treasury? I don't know. Cheliax is if necessary. But we're not going to... Not going to let Asmodeus have permanently destroyed something this important. Is the... Something we could do on the women's policy front that'd be helpful? I think the things that Osirian might contemplate, Your Majesty, are very different from the things Keltum might desire. Part of that is that he's accustomed to a society where, I think, there aren't really any women, just people who like dressing up as them. And part of it is, it felt like there was some important disconnect when we were discussing the differences between Osirian and Absalom, like he thought that in the long run, if you didn't make men care for their children, it wouldn't make any difference in how many children died. I should have asked. I didn't understand. I think it's some kind of heredity theory. Like... Say the propensity to abandon your family is heritable, and say you spend 10,000 years letting men decide whether to abandon their families or not, and say men's children starve if they abandon them, then eventually you'd have a population descended entirely from men, who of their own free and voluntary will don't abandon their families. When you find yourself making a face like that, just speak your mind, Zakia. I don't think Keltham, when he said what he said, was proposing that we spend a thousand years doing that. He's too impatient. Your Majesty, I'm afraid that it could be done in two generations if you were harsh enough about killing all the babies whose fathers abandoned them. And 
that Keltham will propose that, and you'll do it. Well, we probably will if Keltham asks us to. I'll offer you no false comfort there. But I doubt that the first answers of a young man to a puzzle he's never encountered before are also where he'd put money on a prediction market once he's recovered some. What if he doesn't recover, Your Majesty? Not tomorrow, not the next day, not in a year. What if he'll only ever see us as an annoying set of puzzles where everyone's horrible for no reason? You can bet yourself it won't work if you think it won't work. I don't know if it won't work, my lord. I just don't want you to do it. It strikes me as an increasingly dangerous situation that I haven't spoken with Keltham, that he won't speak with me. There's some confusion here, and I don't think it'd survive a real effort to uncover it. He seemed firmly opposed. I have to say, I thought once he was no longer the prisoner of the forces of hell, things would get easier. I also thought they'd invade, especially with Keltham presently very unstable. It seems a better time than next month will be. Why haven't they? You're dismissed, Zakia. Yes, Your Majesty. Nobody's going to kill all the abandoned children until I've sat down with Keltham and ensured that he and I make all the exact same predictions about what will happen and why. I'm glad, Your Majesty. Do you have odds for me that Keltham will be all right in a couple of weeks? Predicting things about people is terrible. You know that? I don't know what class of people to use for comparison. I don't know how much to weight what he says. Or that he's an alien. Or that father seems to get along with him. And I haven't the slightest idea what he'll find when he asks the people of Sothis what should be done with Osirian. If you want to bet he'll be fine, though, I'll give you four. One. Next event. Looking at Sothis, going really outside, in his new world, for the first time. Have they got an amulet of proof against detection for him yet? Actually, they should just have some very high-level caster throw non-detection on him, if he's going outside the dome, but separately Keltham wants such an amulet loaned to him while he is inside Osirian teaching its people, and holding up his end of Abadar's implicit bargain. Yep, they have an amulet, they have a powerful non-detection... They have had eight decoy Keltums wander the streets of Sothis so far today, and none of them have been kidnapped. And he'll be shadowed by enough guards to likely get him to safety or death if anything happens. Do you want me to come along? I should be disguised, if so, as I'll throw off all your experimental results. If you're interested in being along, even if I'm not speaking baseline, then yes, although... You'd throw off my experimental results if you were not disguised, because people would be scared of you and would expect you to report them to governance, which would then carry out threats against them, punish them if they said something critical of governance. It's a much longer sentence in baseline than it would be in Taldane. Words like punishment are not just long, but jarring and ugly in their internal rhythm. Whoever designed this language evidently didn't want people thinking thoughts like this, or maybe just wanted people to notice when they did. Well, they might be scared of that. But even if I were carrying a big sign that said, there will be no retaliation for insulting me, they'd hesitate to speak critically of the pharaoh in front of me because it'd seem rude. I think for most people, the rudeness would loom much larger than the risk they'd get into some kind of formal trouble, really. It's not illegal to criticize the pharaoh, and we don't punish things that aren't against the law but it's still generally not done to speak ill of someone in front of their relatives. I am still going to need some promises protecting the people talking to me, that either their words are not being passed on by any route, or that they are not being identified, and that no effort is being made to identify them after the fact, plus an explicit statement about nothing bad happening to anybody who talks to us, as a result of their talking to us, period. If we're using disguises to make people feel like they're safe, by hiding facts they'd otherwise worry about, they need to be very, very safe. If we're ripping that decision and calculation out of their hands and putting it in ours. Feanar beams at him. Yes, yes, you'll want that from the church, really, not from me. Or I suppose I can say it too if you'd like, but it's not like I'd be badgering them afterwards. Nothing bad will happen to people who talk to us. If somehow something does happen, as a consequence of them talking to us, we'll pay them back for it assuming we reasonably can. Like if Cheliax teleports in right that moment and blows up the whole square, 
We won't be able to afford to resurrect everyone, but we can give their family survivors benefits. I won't identify them or try to identify them afterwards. Funny, isn't it? How Cheliax presumably knows exactly how Abadaran theology works, or at least they can read your books, and yet didn't pose like this to me. I guess they must not have understood, or maybe just didn't think they could pull off that pose. All right, let's get some explicit assurances and then have a look outside at what passes for reality. Oh, and is there any sort of explicit subset of Assyrian that I should be using for talking to Intelligence 10 people? I really don't have any idea how that works. So this in the middle of the daytime is miserably hot. Everyone who can avoid being outside has done so. This leaves rich adventurers and merchants who can afford endure elements and people who are poor but don't have the affordance to make it to shade for the day. Almost everyone is in full coverage fabric, except small children who are generally naked. There are a lot of stray cats. Keltham will seem calmer, maybe even a little friendlier, while he's wandering around outside carefully not inflicting his emotions on other people. Keltham will furthermore note to himself internally, especially now that he's got the higher-powered non-detection layered over his amulet, that the real him seems to be calmer, now that he's trying to give the emotional impression of a calm person. Being outwardly upset and wounded is hazardous to your insides, apparently, even when the upset and wounding are drawing on something real. There may be more wisdom than he understood at first, in Dath Elan's usual practice of not showing off your injuries. As for Sothis, yes, Keltham has grasped the difference between rich people who can afford endure elements and non-rich people who can't, since it's so visually distinct. Keltham's not going to try a non-rich woman until he has experience talking to people that Osirion considers full human beings, though. Any non-busy merchant selling something cheap enough that Keltham could trivially buy it, and the profit on the item would be enough to repay them for some idle chat while Keltham shopped? Plenty of those. Does he want fish? Live animals? Crocodile leather? Bread? Sandals? Newspapers? Newspapers, sure. Let's try one of those. If he ends up not wanting to cart it around, he can always throw it away and buy another one later. What's this newspaper shop like? It's got a teenage boy, maybe Keltham's own age, manning it, periodically dumping water from a barrel on the corner of the stand on his own head to keep cool. The newspaper appears to mainly report on the chariot racing results and the adventures of a foreign correspondent in the wild Mwangi jungles battling savages. There's also a personal ad section. Keltham will buy the newspaper and then ask this male adult his own age what he thinks of the recent political mess. There's always a recent political mess. This is true even in Doth Ilan. They just have different standards. Hmm. You mean last week's cereal on the Mwangi cannibal tribe? It was really popular, sold really well. I have a few leftover copies if you missed it. I was thinking of that whole business with the government, actually. Oh, with the conscription? Pa just told them he needed me in the shop and that was that. We don't cover that kind of thing in the papers. Pa says people want to be entertained and it's no time to feed them their vegetables. Keltham will try reading the personal section of the newspaper rather than carrying on that conversation any further. The carpenter is looking for a strong apprentice, seven-year term, guild membership at the end of it, digression into how the guild is still strong as ever. A healthy man of 28, sailor, is looking for a wife. Doesn't have to be pretty but shouldn't be disfigured. Competent to run a household alone for months at a time of good reputation. The Church of the Dawnflower welcomes all, and we'll have the famous preacher Sati Srinivasan in town this week to speak on the redeeming power of Sarenre. A man wants to place a letter with some religious pilgrims to bring to his dead mother informing her of the birth of his child. A healthy man of 39, a tanner, is looking for a wife urgently as his last wife died in childbirth, leaving him with two young children. He has a steady income and a four-room home. It is possible to purchase insurance against workplace injury for only one silver a week. He'll check two of his inferences with Feyenoord. One, it's cheaper to send a letter along with somebody else's plane shift to Axis, plus pay for Axis's interplanar messaging system, than to pay for your own sending to Axis. Two, marriages in Osirian are match made by men broadcasting what they want and what they have to offer, and women evaluating those broadcasts, never the other way around. That's correct for the letter. A person can take hundreds and hundreds of letters in a bag, whereas for sending you, need to get a fourth circle cleric just for you. Of course, with sending, you know they got it, but Axis has very reliable mail as I understand it. I don't know whether women sometimes take out personal ads, 
I don't really read the newspaper. Women have to apply for the Pharaoh's consideration, and they do do that. Actually, that's kind of a stupid question now that I think about it. If women don't have money, they can't pay for personal ads. So, does Sothis have any kind of exotic snacks? Keltham would like to buy something he can actually use to pay for his next conversation. This so-called newspaper does not seem to be that. There are fried kebab vendors and stuffed dessert pastries and baked sweet potatoes with honey poured over them. He'll buy a stuffed dessert pastry without haggling particularly hard, then ask the vendor what they think of the recent kerfluffle about conscription. Well, the vendor says, I don't see why Jellyaks would invade us. They can't possibly be that stupid. So I wonder what it's really about. Why would it be stupid for Chelyaks to invade, and what'd it be about, if not that? Well, we're a lawful country, and haven't given them any provocation, and weren't part of their empire even when they had an empire, and it'd be very disruptive to shipping, and we'd all rather go to Axis early than surrender to Chelyaks. So I just think it'd be stupid, and I can't imagine they'd try it. I don't know what it's really about. Maybe some other country is trying something, but we don't want to tip our hand that we're on to them. Or maybe it's just an initiative to get all the boys out of the streets and get them to grow up and be lawfuler, halt the moral decay of the younger generations. I approve of that, but they shouldn't say it's about Chelyaks. That's just insulting intelligent people. Aside to Feyenoord in baseline, is governance holding in secret Chelyaks's prospect of spell silver derived military advantage, and that governance is hosting an alien Chelyaks might want to kill, etc.? The loan words Chelyax and Spellsilver are clearly audible in there. Yes. I don't know why. Probably for some kind of politics reason. I'm not going to interfere with your standard information propagation procedures on information affecting the price of widely traded assets without a very good reason. But somebody needs to announce somehow that the price of Spellsilver is liable to drop. People are trading at bad prices. Anybody who finds out early such as Chelyax has a market advantage. Is anybody on that? That sounds like the sort of thing there'd be a whole office of government dedicated to. Merenre will probably tell you who. I'm sort of new to the inner sea area, Keltham will say to the snack vendor in Osirian again. Does the government here make a habit of conscripting people for bad reasons? Do you know? Syrian's government? Well, I wouldn't say they've ever done it before except with a war threatening. What was that you were saying about the Prince Merenre and Cheliax and Spellsilver? Think this one's for you, Keltham will say in baseline. It's secret and you're not supposed to know about it, Fay Anar says. Oh. But it'll be public later, and you can tell all your friends you knew before it was public. Well, all right then. It's not that there's going to be a war, is there? I have sons who are conscription age. There might be a war, but Abadar wouldn't start one unless it was inevitable, and waiting for it to start would just leave us disadvantaged when it did. Okay, that's less OPSEC than Keltham thought they were aiming for. There. But okay. It seems like the sort of thing where we should let the government make their own announcement, but I can tell them that if they haven't gotten around to it in a week, I'll issue my own press release, Keltham will say, in the tone of somebody who apparently delivers ultimatums to national governments on a regular basis and doesn't think much of it. That gets him a stare. You'll tell Abadar to do a press release? Does Abadar usually do those? I was given to understand he had a lot of trouble communicating with humans, and had to like pay Yomadai to send people visions, if he wanted to send one without giving them massive headaches. No, he, uh, rules Osirian from the Black Dome through his human aspect. Wasn't planning to tell that particular... aspect of Abadar. Directly in person, no. I've heard that his sense motive is unreasonably high, and I'm sort of tired of people reading my mind. What's your opinion of how Abadar's been running Osirion? Anything strike you as being, I don't know, non-human gods not really having much idea of how humans work? Well, that's why he has the human aspect run Osirian, he says. But if you ask me, they shouldn't let so many foreigners in. Huh, why? Keltham is obviously a foreigner, but the potential reference of this sentence to himself seems unlikely to be the vendor's intent. Obviously, if the vendor meant that Keltham shouldn't have been let in, the vendor would have just said so. Keltham also has no particular idea of why this would be a mistake that Abadar would be making, so he's of course going to ask. Well, they drink too much and they're irreligious, and lots of the foreign adventurers chew tobacco, which is a disgusting habit. And they've driven such an increase in the brothels and indecency. And even the decent ones. It just bothers me to think of Osirian women marrying foreign men and having mixed children. 
I don't think that should be allowed. I keep stumbling over the idea that Osirian just invented prediction markets, and they're not any better yet than Prince Morenry guessing things. What sort of bad thing happens when there's mixed children, and is there any, like, informal way for people to bet on that sort of thing? The man looks utterly baffled by this question. Well, I mean, they might not get raised properly with a foreign father. Some taverns allow betting, but mostly on the chariot races. Does Osirian's government prohibit betting on anything? Well, yes. You're not allowed to run gambling parlors on games of chance. Never mind, actually. If you were going to change one thing about the Osirian government's present practices, say you had a lot of negotiating leverage with the government for some reason, what would you ask them to change? I'd say a woman shouldn't be allowed to marry a foreign man if there are Osirian men who will have her, he says, and chewing tobacco should be banned. That seems like sort of a frankly self-interested policy. I mean, isn't that just saying outright that you want less mating competition for women coming from mates outside your own personal reference class? Blink, blink, blink. Yes? Okay, maybe I phrased things poorly. Suppose that you knew somebody else with negotiating leverage over the Osirian government, and you were trying to sell them on a policy that was supposedly good for the general public, and not just you personally or your own faction. What would be your policy, ask? The... Well, I think it's good for all decent men, if women can't marry foreigners. Okay, but suppose I asked you for a policy intervention that would be a good idea, relative to status quo, for the average of the entire population, including men and women. Or does that question just never come up around here? Well, it's also good for the women to be prevented from marrying foreign men, since they make bad husbands. You'd naturally expect that there'd be some good foreign husbands, and that women would already be choosing the apparently better husband if there were better non-foreign husbands than foreign husbands on offer to them. Like, by default, you don't usually expect people to get better results when you reduce the options available to them. So there must be something non-default going on there. To be clear, I'm from pretty far away. And if there's some blatant flaw in my reasoning that any child would see... You should explain to me like I'm a younger child than that. Well, they're all seduced by the foreign men with their accents and their fancy ruffles and forget to think about whether a man will make a good husband. What do you predict a woman would say about this key political issue if I asked a woman? Well, a nice respectable one, or a frivolous girl who wants to marry the man with the laciest collar. Both. Keltham will actually just pass the guy a gold piece at this point, or around ten times the cost of the pastry. He's got no idea how much of a strain this conversation must be for an Intelligence 10 person. But they're definitely reaching the point where Keltham feels like he should be paying for things. He blinks, baffled at the gold piece. Thank you, sir. It takes him a while of staring at the gold piece to remember there was an accompanying question. I think a respectable woman would say that she doesn't like the foreign influence. And a woman who isn't respectable likes the foreign men because they're forward and seduce her, unless they leave her bereft in which case she doesn't like that at all. And if it were banned for foreign men to marry her, then she'd know for sure they're only leading her on. Can you expand on doesn't like the foreign influence? Well, she'd notice that having foreign men around is bad, so she'd be against it. Because they deceive Osirian women into marrying them using ruffles and chew tobacco? Yes, that's right. Suppose somebody proposed that a better version of this policy would let women marry foreign husbands if they wanted. If the woman showed intelligence above 16 to detect thoughts, or wisdom above 14 to detect anxieties, in which case she's probably able to figure out for herself how to not be deceived by the ruffles. Would you say that's a better or worse version of the policy? Blink, 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 blink. Well, then all the best girls would marry foreigners, and that'd be bad for the country. You don't sell all your best cattle. Noted. Would it be better or worse for the women, in your estimation? It'd be worse for them. Because? Because they'd marry foreign men. Right. But by hypothesis, they have either WIS-14 or INT-16, which I'm guessing is enough that they wouldn't be deceived by ruffles. And so would only marry a foreign man if they'd made a correct estimate that, in their own self-interest, that man was better than the best domestic man competing. I can see how this could arguendo be bad for Osirion, but it'd be good for the woman herself, if I'm not still missing something. Well, I don't think it would, even if there's an argument. From a foreigner. Why, though? Or is it something you're intuiting, even though you're not able to give a verbal reason for it? That. I assume your objection isn't just to my numbers, and that it should be YS-16 or INT-18 instead. Though, in my grim-dark experience... 
Women with INT-18 are capable of pulling some dreadfully advanced social shit of their own, though I guess she had a plus-four intelligence headband by the time she was doing the more advanced plots. In retrospect, and that's just the headband I knew about. Anyways, if we set the numbers much higher, like 20 WIS or 22 INT, does that change your intuitive estimate of whether being allowed to marry foreigners is good for the woman? I mean, being very smart doesn't change that they're women. Thanks for your time. It was very educational. Bye. You've been speaking to Keltham out of Dathilan, a fact that'll probably mean something more to you later. Goodbye, he says, and serves more customers some pastries. Commentary, Feanor, Keltham will say, after walking what he thinks is a safe distance away for saying the name. I mostly don't talk to people because most people are frustrating and boring. That man was particularly particularly frustrating and boring. You're not going to be able to convince the pharaoh to ban foreigners. Immigration isn't popular, but it's good for countries as long as you can keep expanding the economy, and we think we have an idea of how to do that. Feanor, how smart was that person, based on your own grasp of Galerion's population? Per 1 SD Thinkumpf plus 1 SD Thinkumpf. I don't know, because I don't talk to people because they annoy me. Probably he's a bit above average, if he's got a food shop instead of being a laborer. Bit above average. All right, then. Do you think I'm ready to have a conversation with a female that Osirian thinks of as a woman? I am not feeling very experienced talking to Osirians, but I'm also worried about getting around to actually trying this before I run out of social energy. It's not that different from talking to men. Just don't get up close to her and don't hand her a gold coin. Unexpectedly, she'll think you're trying to buy sex. How do I cause someone to give me complicated, mentally effortful answers if she doesn't expect to get anything in return? I guess the key is doing it expectedly. Feanor, help me out here. I don't want to end up accidentally married to anyone. You can't end up accidentally married to anyone. Marriage is very serious and can only be undertaken with the knowing will of both parties. We're not one of those countries where fathers can marry off their daughters without her even saying yes. You can end up propositioning someone, I suppose. I don't really know what to say to avoid that. I guess you could just say, I'm not trying to pay you for any favor but your conversation, but they might not believe you. You know what? Incinerate all this? We're trying this the high-trust Athilani way. Will people hear... Will women here recognize Abadar's truth-telling, if I cast it on myself? And will they believe that it's real, and not an illusion? I should think so. It's first circle. Even the little village priests have it. And it would be very illegal to imitate it. Right then. What's been the general density and apparent population characteristics of non-rich women in this area? Some of the people at stalls are women. There's a little sewing shop behind one of the stalls, with a sign out front that says Mending and Tailoring, with a woman visible indoors. There are lots of women gathered in the occasionally shady courtyard, spinning and talking. Step one, Keltham will cast Abadar's truth-telling on himself, because he can't do that, and also maintain concentration, as Keltham now has considerable practice doing. There's something about magical casting specifically that interferes with concentration. Step 2. Keltham uses his Detect Thoughts scroll, purchased in Absalom. He did bring his scrolls with himself, through his flight from Cheliax. Obviously, he is most certainly not trying to detect anyone's actual thoughts, but Keltham does want to look around and take note of who are the highest intelligence women present in his range of vision and mark their intelligence levels generally. Six, eight, eight, nine, 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 ten, 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 eleven, 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 twelve, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. The fourteen is one of the women in a shady courtyard spinning. So is the six. He'll mark the six, a ten who's not in the courtyard, and everyone twelve or above, if they have any distinguishing features other than their faces that Keltham can use to so mark them. Step three. Test his approach on one individual before he potentially ruins the whole courtyard with a poor approach. Over to the tenant, who's not in the courtyard first. Hey, I've got a truth spell up in hopes I can say some strange things and have them be credible. In particular, that I'm a cleric of Abadar from outside Osirion. I have no romantic or sexual or generally harmful intentions towards you, and I want to pay you a gold piece 
solely to ask you some weird questions about your personal political opinions, which will be kept anonymous and not otherwise associated to you. Sound reasonable so far? She takes a step back from him, a little suspiciously. Yes, Cicerone. Keltham will pass over the gold piece, putting it down a safe distance from her. I'd like to ask those questions of you later, actually, because I want to set up this survey with some others before my truth spell runs out. If, hypothetically, I were to say under truth spell that I'm from entirely outside Galarian, and that the questions I want to ask you are geared to making sure that I don't harm Galarian in the course of trying to teach things to Osirian to repay a debt I owe to Abadar, would that still work for you, or would you conclude that the truth spell was broken? Well, it's strange that you look human if you're from another planet. I thought the things from other planets had eyes on stalks, and lots of legs, that kind of thing. An excellent point. My current working theory is that humans here were grabbed from, or just arrived from, my home planet at some point a few millennia back. I mean, if I arrived here, so could others. The primary alternative theory would be that reality is very, very, very large. And if you look far enough, you can find other places containing basically humans, despite the lack of any common ancestry. How about if, hypothetically, I said that the God War three months ago was over me and broke out two days after I arrived in Galarian? Blink, blink, blink. I think maybe you should be talking to somebody important. I could take you to a temple. That's already been done, more or less. And now I'm going around talking to ordinary citizens in Sothis to see if I would be doing this world a disservice by helping Osirian to become more powerful or more productive than other countries. You would not want to do that with, say, Cheliax, and I am trying to see whether anything less dramatically horrible than that is wrong with Osirian, which I ought to ask their government to correct before helping them too much. Anyways, it sounds like the basic facts of the matter aren't too out of place for Galarian, so I'll be back in a bit once I've said the basic points to others under Truth Spell before the Truth Spell runs out, if that's okay. Yes, Cicerone? Or actually, to be clear, I might have a whole conversation with somebody else before coming back. Hopefully one GP is enough to make up for the inconvenience there. Keltham will now try to repeat this set-up conversation on the smartest woman not inside the courtyard. Does it go any differently a second time? Nope. About the same. All of these people seem not totally able to keep up with the pace at which he speaks, but able to catch the basics, like that he's a weird, important alien priest of Abadar who wants to ask them questions. On to the courtyard, then. Hi, I'm a cleric of Abadar from entirely outside Galarian, who owes a debt to Abadar that, as I understand it, Abadar wants me to repay by teaching knowledge to Osirian. I want to check I'm not going to harm the rest of Galarian by teaching Osirian, the way someone would be harming Galarian if they taught, say, Cheliax, or if there's anything I should be asking Osirian's government to promise to change, before I start teaching them. To that end, I'd like to pay several of you one gold piece each, to share your frank political opinions with me. I will have some of that conversation via message, with each such person, in case any of you have things to say they don't want overheard, because of social non-accuracy incentives. I won't pass on those opinions in a way that associates them to you and have been promised various obvious things by Abadar's church about nobody else trying to figure out who said them. That's all the gold piece is payment for, and I do not seek anything else from you, nor seek to harm you in any way. They stare. Say that again slower, young man. My hearing's not what it used to be. One of the older women says firmly. He can do that. Everyone else is looking to her for judgment. She frowns. Well, I suppose that's all right so long as you're going to take your ideas to someone wise in the church and not do anything foolish. I was planning to talk to whoever Osirian's government sends me. I did not specify that they be a priest of Abadar, and cannot promise you that I'll only talk to members of the government who are. As for my not doing anything foolish, I'm afraid it's way, way, way too late for that, but I am currently planning to try somewhat harder at not being stupid in the future. Well, I'll pray for you to find wisdom, and have all your big plans turn out all right. You just have to trust that things will come to you. Oh, I definitely trust things will be coming to me. Good things is a whole different question. Any key questions that anybody wants to ask me while I've still got this truth spell up? I haven't lied to anybody since I got to Galerion, as my own people define lying, intentional falsehoods told to create false beliefs. 
other than temporary ones not meant to be exploited. Jokes don't count, nor misleading truths. And I wasn't planning to start in the next hour. But there might still be things you'd want to check while the truth spell lasts. They mostly stare. So you're not looking to get married? One woman about his age asks. I've got no idea what your local standards are like for romantic catastrophes, but I'm currently recovering from one that's plausibly worse along several dimensions than literally anything that I would have expected to have happened on my own higher-functioning home planet in the last year. So, not in the immediate future, no. Well, young man, we are more than the worst mistakes we've ever made. So long as you're supporting the children. Keltham will not answer that. There are thoughts and considerations here that he would not wish to make their way back to Cheliak's. It is in fact possible to make romantic mistakes of greater scope than that, and end up in relationship dramas affecting the whole planet. But those details are not something I'd really like to talk about today. Any other questions? No other questions. Oh, and I currently have running, and am using only to quantify intelligence, not to read minds, a detect thoughts spell. That does mean I can tell anyone their intelligence, privately, if they don't already know it. I would also be interested in hearing anybody's cheerful price if they... just happen to be fairly okay with my reading their mind, if I promise not to tell anybody else what I saw there. Because Galarian is still very strange to me, and it might help me if I could see anyone else's thoughts at all. Is that legal? Someone breaks the sceptical silence to ask. Are you having it running? I mean... I think it'd be legal if I agreed, which I don't. I've got no idea what with not living here, but I'd expect sensible governance to say it's not terrible if you declare under truth spell that you have not and will not read any minds without agreement, as I so truthfully declare. It's off scroll and doesn't have as much time left as the truth spell, so if anybody wants to take me up on that offer, they need to do it quite soon. Letting a man read your mind is probably not as bad as letting him touch you, but it's in the genre. They continue staring suspiciously. Fine and understandable. Super valid. Does anybody want their intelligence told to them, though? What for? Seems a little bit like courting trouble, if you ask me, the old woman says firmly, and everyone else nods like that has settled the matter. Huh. He'll pass out a gold piece to the 6 INT, an 8 INT, a 10 INT, all 12 S or above, and that old woman, should they choose to accept them. Yes, they will accept the gold, with their amount of delight varying from a little delighted to a lot delighted. The woman with 6 intelligence immediately hands it to her sister and says, I got a gold coin, Netta. It's gold, just look at it. Netta swats her with one hand and looks anxiously back at Keltham as if expecting him to snatch the coin back. Keltham will avoid saying anything like, it sure is gold, out loud. She is not in fact a child, except in a moral, ethical sense, and he does not know how to treat with her. His first question is to the old woman, and by message, why would it court trouble to know your own intelligence? Well, she says back, it's just a number, and you might think too much of that number and go around thinking it's who you are. Huh, Keltham says, still by message. In Doth Ilan, my homeland, we just tell people not to think that and have a custom against inquiring of other people's intelligence equivalent. But it seems like fairly important information to know about yourself, even if it doesn't define you. If I see a woman with 14 intelligence, what I was told is intelligence enough for wizard training on the usual scales, should I not be telling her even that, lest that number come to define herself? Or a numerical range, if I just tell her it's at least 14. Well, I don't know. Is she so young that she could try to marry a wizard and learn off him? Or is she already settled and has children? Suppose he doesn't know. Well, he could tell her mother, and then her mother can think about whether a wizard is attainable, and tell her only once they've attained it, if it can be done. This old woman presents as being very wise, and seemingly knows all about the dangers of defining herself by her intelligence score. Perhaps it is safe to tell just her, then, her own intelligence score if not all the other women present. They don't need to know that she was told. Well, she doesn't expect it had hurt her. But it wouldn't help her either, so she can't see why learn it. That is respectable, though he doesn't understand it. Keltham does have questions that he'd ask of a woman who could be a wizard. In her estimation, how much gold ought to be conservatively offered to a woman to generously compensate her for the harm of telling her that she's smart enough to be a wizard? 
Well, what's she going to do with the gold? Hire a servant she can unhappily tell about how she could have been a wizard? It's not the hungry season, and the money won't last that long. Would 50 gold do it? Which girl is it? Her intelligence score is her own private information, which she has not particularly authorized Keltham to tell to anybody else. Well, she can't tell him how much to pay if she doesn't know who it is. If it's Mirna, he should tell her he put 50 gold in trust for her for lessons at the Temple of the All-Seeing Eye, and gave one to Nassim to watch the babies while she's at them. If it's Yamina, he should tell her mother and see if a match can be managed. She points them out. It's almost definitely one of the two of them. They're the bright ones. And which one is it, actually? Myrna, who has a baby strapped to her. Yamina's a twelve. Keltham will remark back only that he didn't particularly say that it was any of the people here. He will also be talking to some women outside this courtyard, whose intelligence scores he has already read. So long as they're talking, what would this woman change about Osirian? Had she the power to ask things of the government here? Is there anything she'd say ought to change about this country before it should be made any mightier or richer than it is now? Well, anything that should be changed will change easier when Osirian's richer. That's how things go. But if anyone asked her, she'd tell the government to ban alcohol. That stuff. Yeah. Keltham has heard of that stuff. Keltham already found it pretty weird that anybody would drink that despite knowing what it does. Do people's decisions to drink that stuff often not work out well for them? Well, lots more men beat their wives drunk than sober. And lots of men waste their family's money that way. And also if women drink too much, the babies will come out wrong. Keltham is not usually a fan of declaring things illegal. But it sounds like this is way above the danger threshold for being illegal, compared to several other things that Keltham has been told are or ought to be illegal, without any exceptions or competence tests. Is there a story about why this isn't already illegal without a competence test, given that, apparently, women owning their own stuff is illegal, which Keltham would have thought was much less dangerous than alcohol? There probably is, because the priests are very wise, but she doesn't know it. Women owning their own stuff isn't illegal exactly either. Not that she could explain the difference to a priest of Abadar. But there is one. A wife isn't a slave. Say more. Well, she's never interacted with the government herself. Part of being wise is knowing the limits of your wisdom, and that isn't hers. But if she earns money, it's the family's money, and the family can spend it on clothes for whoever needs them most or work boots for whoever's have a hole, or an expansion of the house. And it's her husband who'd go to the government, if something happened that involved the government, but that's never happened. He works the winter levy, they don't pay taxes, they give the church money towards a pilgrimage, or an emergency. That's how it is in a healthy, harmonious household, and it doesn't sound right, saying that's it being illegal for a woman to have money. Of course, in some households, they all put their money in for the family, and then the husband spends it on drink. And that's no good and why she thinks drink should be banned. But husband's spending couldn't reasonably be banned. And it wouldn't be better if the wife could squander all the money on drink, too. What you want is for no one to squander it. Suppose you've got a trio relationship, three people forming a household. One man and two women, say, so there's no paternity questions. If they had to spend money by majority vote, no single one of them could spend all the money on alcohol. Or, in duo relationships, why doesn't the person in the relationship with the higher wisdom get to control the money? Well, there's an idea. Might work out well, except it's not as if people know what their wisdom is. Usually, if a man has two wives, he has two households, one with each wife. Trying to all live together doesn't work out well. Why not let women control their own incomes when they haven't yet married somebody? If they're old enough to earn their own money in the first place. Well, children who haven't married yet, boys or girls, are part of their parents' households. And once they can work, their money goes to supporting their family. Would the world be a better place if they were allowed to leave and own themselves? If they asked to leave? If no, why not? Well, it'd be hard on a family to go hungry and work themselves to the bone to feed and bring up a child who waltzed out the door and left their parents and younger siblings to starve as soon as they'd finished the education their parents put them through at great cost. Probably people'd invest less in their children's education if their children were liable to do that. Mm. 
If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash AI. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059 